It's time for Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. Now, here's Bart Scott and Dan Grossa. And welcome into another edition of Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. Dan Grossa joined, as always, by my partner, former Jet linebacker, Bart Scott. Bart, how we doing? Kuda Matata. Could be better, but they definitely could be worse. Definitely, as always. We know things didn't go according to plan for the Jets yesterday. In London, flew across the Atlantic and came home a 27-20 loser to the Atlanta Falcons. And, Bart, unfortunately, some of the problems that plagued them on Sunday in London were really some of the same issues that have really bit them earlier in the season in some of those losses. Slow starts by the offense, really digging the team too much of a hole, and then the deficit too much to crawl out from in the second half. Yeah, and also you talk about the first drive or one of the first drives. You talk about penalties, extending drives for the opposing offense and understanding that you have to understand what the what the assignment is. And the assignment, the assignment yesterday from a defensive standpoint was making sure that you took away Pitts, make sure that you take away Patterson, who can hurt you in so many different ways. And they failed to do that effectively and allowing them to convert a lot of third downs. Matty Ice kind of shredded them, understanding that he's a veteran quarterback and he, he wasn't going to – hold on to the football like Ryan Tannehill did the the week before. So, I mean, for all the defensive linemen that were licking their chops, understanding they had a stationary target, understand that sometimes when, you know, you don't have a, a, a mobile quarterback, he understands that. And you got to give your, you know, tip your hat to Arthur Smith. He did a great job in devising a game plan, which allowed um, – Matt Ryan to really kill you death by a thousand paper cuts, getting the ball out of his hands, a lot of sitting in zones and taking advantage of big plays when they presented themselves. You talk about Pitts getting his first touchdown um, and, and really going for nine for 116. We knew that without Ridley, without Gage, that that was going to be the mission and they failed to execute their game plan. No doubt about it. And Arthur Smith, ironically enough, the offensive coordinator for Ryan Tannehill and the Titans the last couple of years before getting the Falcons job. You mentioned Kyle Pitts. He had his breakout game. You know the talent is there, right? He's the fourth overall pick in the draft. The guy's a beast coming out of Florida. Eventually it was going to happen. Unfortunately for the Jets, it just came against them. And you mentioned Matt Ryan, and I think you hit it right on the head. You know, he's a sage veteran quarterback. The guy's been in the league now for almost 15 years. He's seen it all. Every look, every defense thrown out him he knows what to do so this defense which harassed Tannehill last week with the seven sacks the 14 quarterback hits they weren't as fortunate this week because Matt Ryan didn't give them the opportunity to tee off on them like maybe Ryan Tannehill did the previous week well of course right you have to understand your personnel understand that you know Tannehill has to hold on to the ball because he doesn't have the arm talent in the football acumen and that scheme isn't built like that right you talk about Matty Ice a former MVP in his league first overall pick from Boston College. He's a guy that's made a career in dropping back and getting rid of the ball. He's never been mobile. So it's not like this is a Ben Roethlisberger or somebody who had been a mobile quarterback that all of a sudden had to try and adjust to his declining skill set. Matt Ryan still has plenty of arm, but he's always had plenty of brain. And, you know, he's always been a guy that can think the game. And he saw, you know, zones and things that he had seen a million times before, and he, he, he exploited it. Right, and he exploited his matchups, and Patterson, you know, is having his best season as a pro because finally, I think Arthur Smith has found a way to utilize all his skill sets: his skill set as a running back, his skill set as a slot receiver, his skill set as a returner, and his skill set as a gadget guy. And, and all those things were on display yesterday. And the Jets, you know, just didn't get it done. And, you know, they have to go back to the drawing board and figure it out. And from the offensive standpoint, you have to be a balanced offense. 17 times rushing the ball doesn't even matter how how much the team is ahead. You still have to be committed to the run because it sets the table for everything. I thought at no point that game was out of hand where they had to abandon the run. And I felt like they panicked a little bit and started getting a little bit too pass happy. And what that does is that stops the clock and puts that defense right back on the field. As you talk about in the first quarter, 31 snaps to six, right? You know, so you talk about the disparity, uh, the, 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 um, the, disp <laughs> I can't even get it out, man. But, you know, you the talk about the difference. Yeah, discovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. You talk about that between the offense and the defensive snaps. Eventually that defense, the first thing that goes when you get tired is your mind and your ability to communicate and execute. And that's kind of what happens. 
You know, you make up a good point, and you, of course, being a defensive player, you can attest to this. There was a lot of talk throughout the week about the heavy workload that the defense absorbed in the win over Tennessee, right? 93 snaps on the field. Shoot, if you want to throw in penalties, it was around 100. That was the fourth most snaps a defense was on the field in the last 20 years in the National Football League. Some of those guys, like C.J. Mosley, they were on the field for every single snap in that game. So they were talking all week about, you know, do you have the tired legs at all? Now getting on the plane and flying overseas to London to play that game. Exactly. All those things. And then if look at the time of possession in the first quarter of that game yesterday, I mean, Atlanta had the ball 11 and a half minutes to three and a half for the Jets. That adds up over time. So how much were those guys feeling it, you think, on the defensive side of the ball to where when the Jets got this to within 2017 in the fourth quarter, Atlanta then is able to manufacture a 75 yard drive, go right down the field and pretty much put it out of reach. Of course, it, it makes a difference, right? You know, of course. And you talk about, you know, the workload the defense is, is, is doing every week. You know, you, th- you think about the later games, you know, game 14, 15, you know, you're going to feel that, right? Because it's harder to recoup because you're putting a lot of miles on, on the tires or on the legs of these players. And I thought C.J. Mosley, who had a tremendous game, looked a little bit tired and lethargic on some of the blitzes, you know, coming off. He didn't have that same spring and that pop in his legs, right? And, and you think about that. And that's why, you know, even though this is an early buy, it might be just what the doctor ordered for the Jets as their defense needs to recover and recoup and their offense needs to figure out what their identity and who they are. Are they a run first team? Are they a play action team? Are they a horizontal team? Are they a vertical team? And I think you have to tweak the game plan to the personnel that you have. And you have to use everybody, right? You have to use all 53. And I think they're going to have to give some more people you know, some opportunities on the offensive side of the ball to just do what they do well, right? You have to find guys and say, hey, he does this well. Let's put in positions to do that and grow their packages, you know, from there forward. You're listening to Inside the Jets. Remember, Jets fans, you can watch the Inside the Jets through the Jets app presented by Fubo Sportsbook. Go to the App Store or Google Play right now and search official New York Jets. Maybe the most surprising thing going into that game is we talk about the offense a little bit, Bart. You know, they had their best game of the season against Tennessee. Zach Wilson had his best game of the season in that victory over the Titans. You were expecting to build on that a little bit, and then you look at the upcoming opponent in the Falcons – They were last in the NFL in scoring defense, right? They had allowed at least 32 points a game in three of their four contests leading up to the game there in London. And that was maybe the most surprising thing that the offense couldn't build off what had happened the previous week, couldn't take advantage of a Falcons unit, which had been picked apart pretty good by their opponents so far this year. And, you know, we hit on a little bit in the beginning, the inability of this offense to get going early in the games. I mean, Bart, five games into the season, the offense hasn't scored a point yet in the first quarter. See, sometimes you got to understand you can't look at everything from your perspective, right? So the same way that the Jets were looking at the Falcons, you got to understand that the Falcons are looking at you in a certain way. And what they what they saw when they put on the Tennessee film is, yes, this young kid has an electric arm, right? He has tremendous arm talent. But a lot of those plays were not scripted plays. So how do we stop him from having the explosive plays and make him beat us left-handed or make him beat us doing what he's not really, really been shown that he can do on a consistent basis. And that's being an accurate quarterback that's throwing the ball on target, that's throwing the ball short and and, and having these eight to 10 play drives. And that's what they forced him to do. And and Zach came up short with that. And I I think he'll be the first one to tell you that he has to be more accurate. And I think that all starts with his fundamentals and making sure that whenever he unleashes a football or he releases a football, that he's making sure that his mechanics are intact. Because when things get hot and you get tired and, you know, you have to always have your fundamentals. And I know we always laugh and we make fun of like Jameis Winston with his pregame, you know, exercise with the towel. And we laugh at Dak with the little Dak dance, warming his hips up. But, you know, those are the things when you talk about beating it into your memory, muscle memory. It takes 10,000 hours for something to become routine or something to become you know, second nature without you thinking about it. And I think that's really what Zach is going to have to focus on and needs to focus on in his time off is making sure that when he releases a football, unless there's no other option, he releases that football and making sure that he's balanced and that he's throwing to his target and it's not somebody's sidearm thrown off schedule. Like I say all the time, the worst thing and the best thing that ever happened to the NFL in the last couple of years is Patrick Mahomes. Right. And you're starting to see he's starting Good point. to and it's starting to go the wrong way for him, too, because we talk about, you know, throwing the ball off platform, off schedule, sidearm, this arm, underarm, overarm. Right. But at the end of the day, who's the guy that's been the most consistent in his league? It's Tom Brady and Tom Brady beats the fundamentals. Right. 
and you have to work the fundamentals because at the end of the day, the fundamentals is what you lean on when all things break down around you is making sure that you can organ that you can be um, fundamentally sound in the midst of chaos that inside of the hurricane is where it's the most safest. And when you do that and your arm and your shoulders are aligned to your target, you will be more accurate. And when you're more accurate, you're putting the balls in the, some of the best athletes hands in space and let them do the work. Right. You don't have to put it all on yourself. So if I'm Zach Wilson, I'm going back to the fundamentals. I'm making sure that when I release a football, it's from the proper position. Just like in the NBA, Tim Duncan did it so well for so many years. He was the big fundamental when it came to the NBA side of things. You're 100 percent right. Speaking of the Jet quarterback, here's Zach Wilson caught up after the game with Bob Wischusen. Zach, I guess let's start from the beginning. Um, the slow starts, the inability to get some of that momentum going that you seem to find a way to get going in the second half, but not being able to score points in the first half. What do you think has to happen for this offense to flip the switch early so you're not constantly trying to fight from behind? Yeah, I don't know. You know, and that's what we're that's what we're trying to figure out as a team is how we can get started early. You know, I got to play better from the beginning. You know, I'm sure everyone's thinking the same thing. And so uh, going into this bye week, that's the focus. You know, how can we start fast? You know, this league is too hard to, to always be coming from behind. So, um, you know, we got to figure something out there. Is the game moving fast for you? I mean, do you feel like at some point it's going to get a lot slower than it is right now? Does it even slow down during the game? Yeah, I mean, of course, of course, you know, the more I'm playing, you know, the slower I feel like the game is getting, you know, it's going to keep getting slower as I get older and, and keep getting reps. But, you know, I wouldn't say it's, uh, um, you know, the reason why we're having these, you know, struggles early in the game. You know, I feel like it's just, it's a confidence thing team wide, you know. I got to come out and, and throw that thing and um, just get us going from the beginning. You know, we can't have those three and out drives to start the game. It's, it's you know, demoralizing and it, it kills our tempo and, and energy. You know, you mentioned the bye week. Bye week can be about self-scouting. What do you think you're going to be able to work on and even learn about yourself in this offense as now you've got a couple of weeks to get ready for your next one? Yeah, really the same thing we've done every single week. You know, how can we just uh, get better from the tape? keep working on those things in practice. And then of course, starting faster, you know, we got to get some points out from the beginning and um, you know, that's uh, that's something we got to figure out. All right, Zach, safe trip home. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So that's Zach Wilson here. And you're listening to inside the jets brought to you by selective insurance, be uniquely insured. And when you look at this offense, Bart as a whole here, I mean, obviously it starts with the quarterback. I mean, he's the ringleader. Everything runs through him. Yesterday, he got another weapon back in Elijah Moore, and that's a guy who, you know, through five games really hasn't lived up to the production level that maybe we were all kind of anticipating all throughout the spring and the summertime. I mean, this guy was advertised as being one of the most electric players on this roster, yet he still really hasn't quite felt, found his niche yet through five games in his rookie season. I mean, that's a whole nother discussion, right, because we saw this across town with the Giants and uh, Kadarius Toney, who had a breakout uh, game yesterday but he was in his natural position. When we talk about Elijah Moore and everything that he did in college, it was from the slot. And, you know, they're trying to, you know, make him an outside receiver. I think he operates better in the slot. And I understand that Jamison Crowder is there, but it's still an opportunity to put him in positions to be successful. He's a guy that should be used, in my opinion, much like Rondell Moore out there in Arizona because that's the type of player he is. He's a smaller guy. You put him in a slot, guys can't put their hands on him with his tremendous speed. It allows him to run by people. And when you're in a slot, also, it allows you to go against a nickel, which is usually – Nickels are nickels because they're not good enough to be corners all the time, right? And it's a unique skill set to be able to, to operate in a phone booth when you really can't use your physicality to jab people. So I think, you know, when, you know, they go and they assess and they self-scout, I think maybe giving Elijah Moore an opportunity to be in the inside would be a more comfortable space for him, which allows you to get him the ball in space, which allows him to use his yak or his after catch, you know, ability and maybe, just maybe, we can see a guy like Mims who continues to have a tremendous, you know, yards per catch. You know, we talk about the 27-yard reception, but also just being a much bigger um, um, target. You look at what's yep. going on around the league, you see guys like Jamar Chase, right? All these guys are making plays on the outside, outside the numbers, and they're covered. But what's, what you can't coach and what you can't teach is size and speed. And a guy like Mims has that size and speed that I believe can take advantage outside the numbers because you look at some of those balls, even one of the balls that were thrown to um, Moore on the sideline that was incomplete, if a guy is 6'2", 6'3", he can go up and get that and still have the wherewithal to keep his feet in bounds, 
right? We watched the Buffalo Bills last night and Knox is covered and he's just a tight end, a slow tight end, right? And you're saying, well, he's covered. Well, not really. He's 6'5". So his catch rate is just so much better than a guy that's defending him. So it's pretty much like posting guys up. So, you know, the, the Jets have a lot of work to do um, because they have to reimagine maybe what they were doing isn't getting, getting you know, isn't effective when you talk about getting off to a fast start, maybe running the ball a little bit more and giving Elijah Moore, who's a dynamic playmaker, the opportunity to make those plays from the slot position can open his offense up. And now they get a chance to take a step back and reflect a little bit with the bye week upon us. And, you know, maybe it's a little bit earlier than than we're accustomed to seeing here five weeks in. But it does have, I think, its positives because when the Jets return from the bye, defense could be getting a little bit healthier, right? I mean, Jared Davis is going to return in all likelihood by the end of the month. Marcus May should also return to help out that defense. Those are two guys who were starters at the beginning of the season for this group that, you know, figures to join a unit that has already flashed some young potential with some of the other guys that are getting some reps here in their absence so maybe things rounding into form a little bit more for them once they return from that week off that's a, that's a, that, that, that's a very valid point right and you talk about you know the guys coming in continuing that um that chemistry and and kind of picking up where they left off and you talk about with with, with Quentin and what he's been able to do and now you put Davis there it gives you a much better you know you know linebacker core from an experience standpoint, you know, and you put Davis out there and you let Quinn stay out there. And now you have some guys that you can do some more unique blitzing packages with. And, you know, it's not always CJ kind of rounding off on the blitz or sink front. You can allow CJ to kind of stand in the middle because I think that he's so much more effective. You know, he is a good blitzer. He's a guy that's tremendous when you talk about the concepts of route combinations, right? And I don't think Quentin is quite there yet, understanding formations and route combinations so that, you know, all those underneath throws that were that were given to Pitts and that was given to, uh, to, to Patterson, you know, a guy like CJ can pick some of those balls off. We've seen it, you know, in his debut when he came here two years ago in Buffalo yep. with the pick six. So, you know, he's a guy that understands, and it takes a unique quarterback to understand when you're being – I mean, linebacker, when you understand when you're being high low. And that's what happened a lot yesterday. Young guys were – we call it, you know, biting, taking the cheese. You know, that little cheese they put in front of you, and you step up and they throw the ball behind you. When we come back here on Inside, the Jets will be joined by veteran Jets wide receiver Jamison Crowder. Number 82 stops by right here on Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. All right, welcome back to Inside the Jets. Dan Cross alongside Bart Scott. It's time now for our player guest segment brought to you by EY, building a better working world. And pleased to be joined today by a third-year Jet wide receiver. It's Jamison Crowder, who's nice enough to give us some time here on the bye week. Jamison, Dan, and Bart, thanks for joining us today, my friend. How are you? Doing good. Now you talk about playing in London yesterday. I'm sure I'm assuming you guys just got back. You know, it's one of two things that usually happens in, in London. Usually you get off to a fast start or you get off to a slow start. It seemed like yesterday you guys just could get started, get in a rhythm, especially early in the first quarter. You talk about having six offensive snaps. You know, any uh, understanding about why you guys couldn't get in the rhythm, how you couldn't get your first 15 going? Um, uh, I mean, honestly, I don't know, man. You know, it's just been something that uh that we've been that we've been uh challenged with this 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 year, man, is getting out to a fast start. And uh that's definitely something that we have to address and address quickly. Um, you know what I'm saying? If if, if we want to have some success going forward, um, you know, we got this bye week, so that's definitely a, a point of emphasis that we're gonna um, you know, look at uh, is is getting a faster start in the first half. Um yesterday I just thought that, you know, we got to a slow start start, obviously, and just couldn't get into a rhythm. Um, the defense was out there for a long time on the field, and um, you know we didn't, we did, we definitely didn't help those guys out. You know by having quick three and outs. A lot of it was new yesterday, of course, playing in new city, new country, new stadium, all those things. Preparation wise, routine, did everything feel similar as if it would if you were playing a game back here in the states? Uh, no, nah, I didn't feel the same. It was definitely different. Um, you know, there's a few things I do. Uh, as far as routine wise that I wasn't able to do. But um, you know, it wasn't an excuse though. I felt I actually felt pretty good going into the game yesterday. Um, like I said, man, it was just that slow start. Man, I thought, you know, a second half, man, we came out. Um, you know, T. Cole had a had had the huge return and helped set up, you know, the the offense for the first touchdown right there. Um, right in the first half. And then we had a couple, you know, possessions where we um, you know, couldn't get anything going. But I think, you know, towards the end of the game, man, we was able to get into a rhythm and um, uh, you know, put up some points. But um, I don't think that, um, you know, obviously, you know, just playing in a different country and everything, yeah, it, 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 it had a, an effect a little bit, but 
Uh, me personally, I felt good yesterday at the game. What was off though? I, I was just gonna say, like, just to follow up on you saying some things that were a little bit different. Like, like what was different that stood out to you the most? You think, Jameson? Well, I mean, definitely the time. The time changed. I mean, uh, you know, it was a little bit earlier, or your body just, you know, feels like it's earlier there. And I'm an early morning person, so I really, you know, I, I didn't really feel, you know, affected by it that much. But I, I think some guys did. Um, and just, you know, just a few things I like to do. I Man, I have a few people that I, that I like to see um, prior to the game and get my body and stuff going. And uh, you know, being that we got that we went there a day early, I wasn't able to do that. So, um, you know, just. In my mind, you know, just some of the things I, that I normally do, I wasn't able to do, but um, but I was good, though. You know, when you look across the league, it's a lot of young rookie quarterbacks starting for the first time, and, uh, and all of them are kind of having similar problems, right? You know, you think about you know, Justin Fields, you think about Mac and Cheese, who's probably doing the best because, you know, he's not asked to do much, you know, but when you look at most quarterbacks, whether it's Lawrence, you know, you, you see some inconsistencies you see, like, maybe skipping the ball and thing of that sort. How hard is it, you know, for you as a veteran to try and establish a rhythm and that nonverbal communication that you need when you have a – not only just a quarterback, but just a young quarterback to establish where he can expect you to be and where he needs to throw the ball for every type of receiver? Because I'm assuming that every receiver likes their ball a little differently, placed at whether it's eye level, whether it's midsection so I can continue to run – how do you continue or how do you start to develop that type of chemistry? You know, yesterday you had a, a nice little bubble screen, kind of skipped the ball. Is it maybe just you see a lot of these young quarterbacks? I'm just talking about Zach. I'm just talking about in general your observation in the league. Like these young quarterbacks aren't really sticking to their fundamentals because they're doing the, the big plays, the splashy plays, but the routine plays, it seems like all these guys are struggling with it. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously that, that's – I just think that uh, you know, I, I think with society now, they kind of, it, it, it kind of, it, it doesn't allow young quarterbacks to develop. You know, we all know that it's a tough league. You know, it's very rare that you have guys just come in and make an instant, you know, impact on the team or like an instant, you know, uh, organization change and player just in an instant like that. Like every guy has to develop, and the quarterback position that's obviously one of the toughest, if not the toughest position. You know to go out there and 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 be in control of on Sunday. You got to know all the plays, know all the routes, know the protection, this and that. And um, you know, I think that sometimes you know a lot of people expect for young quarterbacks to come in and just you know be that guy, and they don't allow for guys to develop. But you know, that's any player. You got to you got to got to develop. You have to um, you know take what the defense gives you. You know, make sure that you can you know make those you know mid range, mid you know uh, you know short throws, and then. When the when when the big play comes, take advantage of it. And um, I just think that you know, uh, you know, the, the media and somebody like that don't give guys time to develop, and, and and that's just something that you have to go through. You know, you got to develop. Guys have to develop. You have to put in the time, have to practice, and you have to get better. Now, less is more, right? You know, I always say less is more, especially when you have young, you know, quarterbacks. But it seems like you know Zach Wilson's been asked to do a little bit more than most of these guys. You know, because you look at the rushing numbers, right? Seven, you know, 17 attempts. Like, I know you're a receiver, but would you even invite, you know, the attempt to run the ball a little bit more to try and establish a rhythm so that when you do do that play action or you try and get in behind the linebackers in front of the safeties, that real estate is a little bit more open? Because it seems like you guys are establishing the pass before you establish the run. You know, would you be on board with that? Or do you, you know, maybe see that? You've seen a lot of football, right? You've been around the league at this time, was this like your eighth or ninth year? You know what I mean? So you've seen it work both ways, rather on the teams that you've been on or the teams uh, that you face. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I think you know, if you want to have success in this league, you have to better run the football. Um, I just think you know, for example, for yesterday, I just thought that we got in a hole, and um, you know, I, I feel like you know a lot of fans and stuff they want us to run the ball, run the ball, but you know, we just kind of needed some some splash plays to kind of get back in the game um, yesterday. But uh, but I, but I agree with you though. You know, if you want to have some have success as an offensive unit, you have to be able to you know mix in that run with that pass. Um, because a lot of times you know the pass game is predicated off the run. So, uh, and that's one thing that we have to you know uh, address going forward and be better at is uh getting the run game going early. 
keeping the defense on their toes for sure. We're talking with Jamison Crowder. I'm curious, you know, you missed those three weeks at the beginning of the season. You had the groin injury, you had the COVID, so that kept you off the field and away from getting those practice reps with Zach. And I'm curious, Jamison, timing-wise, rhythm-wise, is that all the way back between you two, or is that still working its way back into where you'd like it to be here in midseason form? Well, I mean, I feel like – um. I mean, me personally, I feel like I'm good. I feel like uh, I think that Zach thinks I'm in a good place. Um, you know, obviously we had some, uh, we made some big connections um, in the Tennessee game. And like, you know, yesterday, you know, it was just tough. I thought, you know, for everybody to kind of get into a rhythm. And, um, you know, that's just that was just the flavor of the day yesterday. But I think, you know, it, it, it's not too hard for me to get into a rhythm or get a connection with a quarterback just because of the the routes that I run, you know, the, the routes that I'm asked to run and stuff like that. I don't run a lot of deep routes. So a lot of my routes are short, intermediate routes. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I, you know, um, yeah, I like, you know, for, for ball placement to be here or there, but um, a lot of times it's not, it's not hard to find a guy like me in the middle of the field or, you know, on a, on that quick out or a quick slant or whatever. So I feel like our, our, our timing is there. We just got to connect more going forward. Jamison, hang tight. We're going to have more with Jamison Crowder when we return here on Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. And welcome back to Inside the Jets. Dan Gross alongside Bard Scott. And we're talking with Jamison Crowder. Our player guest segment is brought to you by EY, building a better working world. The bye week has arrived just five weeks into the season, Jamison, maybe a little bit sooner than the Jets are accustomed to over the last couple of years. How about for somebody like yourself who missed the first few games? Do you feel like you need a bye week? You're ready for the bye week? Or would you like to just keep this thing going? Well, yeah, me personally, I, I, I definitely don't need a bye week. You know, that was just my second game back yesterday. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I, I definitely need some time to get, you know, keep going, but, you know, uh, I'll take the Bobby right now. You know, I know some guys need it. Um, and it's, and it's going to be much appreciated. It's just time to kind of, you know, reflect and, and, and evaluate, you know, things that we need to work on and, um, you know, going forward, we know it's going to be a grind. So, um, me personally, you know, I, I need some time to be out there on the field, but you know, the bye week is here and it is what it is. I know that once this bye week is over, it's going to be a grind. So it is what it is. Yeah, you you really can't control when you get your bye week. You 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 get it, you know, early. You get it late. It is what it is. You just make the best out of it. And making the best of it is maybe for some of these young players and some of these guys that are banged up a little bit to try and get healthy. You know, one of those guys is Makai Beckton. I don't know how close he is to returning, but he should have an instant impact. You know, as you guys come back and try and make a mini run, you know, but. When you talk about, you know, how different players attack their bye week, you know, you being a veteran player, you know what you need to do for your body to kind of get in shape. You know, a lot of guys who haven't started has been injured, may not be in a peak condition that they need to be in. You know, what would you what do you say to like your young receivers like Elijah Moore, some of the young guys about how they should handle their bye week? Because you can go too hard. You know, I, I remember Howard Green, you know, one year <laughs> Rex said, hey, man, I need you to come back, you know, and, and, and lose some weight. This dude came back 12 pounds heavier. We had to cut him. It's like, come on, dude. This is like a slap in the face. How do you gain 12 pounds in a week? But you know that can happen for guys who, you know, they go on vacation. Now, with COVID, maybe guys won't be going to the Bahamas laying out. But what would you say to some of these young guys about being able to take care of business and coming back and understand what this physical grind is all about? Because now you you won't have a break, and it's going to be a much longer season than their college days. Yeah, no. Nah, I mean, um, you know, just just to the young guys, man, just understanding the position we're in right now. We're not a, you know, five and O team or three and two team. We're one and four, you know. So we're not a team to. We're, by no means do guys need to be taking a, a vacation at all. Now, you know, you kind of you know go somewhere, um, you know, just kind of let your mind, um, you know, relax and kind of get things off football. But uh, you know, for us to 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 be a better team coming out of this bye week. We have to really lock in on, on the things that we need to work on going forward, whether that's from an individual standpoint or from a team standpoint. So um, that's why I tell the young, you know, some some of the younger guys just, you know, understand that, yeah, we got a bye week. But look, just take this time to really reflect, reflect on how you can become, you know, be a better player coming back to help this team, um, you know, be better getting out of this bye week and going forward with the season. Still a, lot of, still a lot of season left, obviously. Now with the extra game, you still have 12 more to play. And, you know, you used the word reflect there. And I heard Corey Davis after the game yesterday saying, we're better than a one in four football team. When you take stock of where this team is, small sample size, just the five games, how would you assess where this club is at now and where they're going to be moving forward after the bye? Well, I mean, I just think right now we just, you know, a team like we, I, I feel like we have the talent across the board, especially on the offensive side of the ball and defensive side of the ball. 
but offensively, man, we have the talent, and um, we just got to, you know, put put it together. That's what that, that's what I see, and um, that's what I've seen. You know, even the time the, the three games I was out, we have the guys that can make plays. We have the running backs. Um, you know, what I'm saying Zach. You know, he's young. He's still learning, but he still can make you know make the plays. And we just got to put it all together. You know, we sit back and watch film, and um, you know, when you watch it, you just see you know a play here or a missed assignment there. And you know certain plays are, are are that close from being you know big plays, and I think that's something that a lot of fans and stuff don't get to see. They get to see the TV copy, but you know as players we get to see the film copy, and you see just some of the small details that that we're that we're not locked in on. You know some of the things that we miss, where certain plays can be big plays in the game that can help you know contribute to a win. Um, so that's you know to, to this point, that's what I've seen, and like I said, man, taking this bye week and really locking in and reflecting and, and and seeing those small details that we're missing, just trying to clean those up going forward. So, you know, those big plays when they when 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 they present themselves, we take full advantage of them. Just from the outside looking in, you know, I saw that you guys tried to manufacture some of those explosive plays, but this time trying to make sure that you secure the edge because now, you know, the defensive ends aren't flattening down and, you know, allowing Zach to get outside. So I saw you guys cutting down the edge, make sure that you give some attention to the defensive end and let some of these plays mature down the field. But, you know, the problem that, you know, or not the problem, or, or the question that I, that I pose and that I'm trying to figure out is what is this team, right? Because when you talk about, you know, rookie quarter, quarterbacks, you have to have an identity. And, like, I took Joe Flacco to a, to the AFC Championship his rookie year, took Mark Sanchez to the AFC Championship his rookie year. But we had an identity, right? We were ground and pound, and, listen, that's how we we're going to win, not allowing Mark to kind of, you know, expose himself or throw the ball, you know, or, 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 or lose the game for us. You know, I guess what I want to ask you, have you guys established or found your identity? And if, it, if you have, what is it? Yeah, I'm not, well, I think, you know, we, we, we still trying to find it. I mean, obviously, we want to get the run game going. And like I said yesterday, man, was just an example of things you can't do in this league if you want to be successful. And that's, you know, dig yourself in the hole. Um, you know, you dig yourself in the hole, you kind of get away from, you know, what you want to do, uh, what you tend to do. So I think, obviously, man, the run game is, 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 is what our offense is built off of. And we have to get that going going forward if we want to have any success. How about this offense, the scheme? It's a new system, you know, the finer points of it. Do you feel like it's when you say it's a detail here, a detail there? Do you think any of that is re related to the scheme at all, Jameson? Or do you think you guys are, you know, lock in step with the West Coast system now? Well, I mean, I feel like, you know, the West Coast, man, it was a system I played in before. Um, like I said, the details here and there, the, 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 the things that we see on film, you know, are, are, are just, you know, individual related, you know, like I said, and this, and it's all of us as a unit, you know, it's, you know, one play, the receivers are doing what they need to do and the line is, not or the receivers aren't doing, what we need to do what being our details and the line is. So it is one of those things that we just have to all get on the same page. And, and like I said, going forward, I think if we can do that, if we can get on the same page, we can have, you know, success going forward. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, when you establish a new system, sometimes you, you kind of put too much in at one time. Do you think maybe just kind of doing less is more in this instance and let, allow you guys to just get great at one thing? And kind of, you know, we heard Solid say before, it's okay to win ugly. You know, sometimes winning ugly can be only throwing the ball 20 times and just kind of being still being in the game. So when you guys establish a rhythm, you guys set up some plays and stuff early in the first you know, half with some of these formations that you'll be able to exploit the team when you give them the same duplicate look in the second half. You know, you think maybe less is more in this instance as, you know, you, you've been in the West Coast system, but you guys have so many young guys that you're dependent on that, you know, they just don't have the experience to understand situational football. They're still trying to figure out what this league is all about. Right. No, um, yeah, you know what? And I, I mean, honestly, I, I don't feel like we have a lot of volume, you know what I'm saying, in the in the in the offense. I feel like everything is is um you know it's easy to grasp. Uh and it's just, you know, it's just one of those things of like you said, having those young guys, they have to, you know, get that understanding and get that experience. And uh, obviously that's gonna come, you know, the more they play ball. But in my opinion, I don't think that we have, you know, too much. Um I wouldn't say that, you know, there's a lot uh for the guys that they, you know, can't can't pick up. Um, I just think that, you know, some of the some of the small things that they don't understand is going to come with experience. And it's just one of those things that that we all as players have had to, you know, deal with and um, had to go through. Um, but I don't I, I don't I don't think that the system is, is too much for 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 the guys to bear. 
Thanks again to Jamison Crowder for joining us here. Still a lot more inside the Jets when we return. Dan Gross and Bart Scott presented by EY, building a better working world. And welcome back to Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. Dan Gross alongside Bart Scott. And Inside the Jets is also brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today. Use code GREEN for a special offer when you sign up only at DraftKings Sportsbook. I, I, you know, as we jump in here and look at week five around the National Football League, I, I, I want to get your opinion because obviously the kicker holds a special place on a football team. You know, some people consider them true players, others don't. As a guy who went to war with them for so many years, some better than others, some help you win games, some not so much. When you saw all the, dramat all the dramatics involving the kickers at the end of some of these games yesterday, as a former player, how does that make you feel? I mean, listen, a lot of times we say kickers have feelings too, or they're people too. Not when they miss as many extra points and bunnies as they missed yesterday. I mean, can anybody make a field goal in the in the Bengals and the Green Bay Packers that game? You talk about like five miss or four miss field goals within the last two minutes and 14 seconds. It was ridiculous. And it's amazing. And it's a shame that sometimes it comes down to those those players, but it does. And you know, I've always been fortunate enough, you know, I played with um Matt Stover, who at the time was the most accurate kicker in NFL history and think Banerjack took it and now Justin Tucker is. But I've been fortunate enough that way. It's like one of those things is they're players if they're good for you and you're on a, you got a good one. But, man, if you if you have a bad one, man, you you lose some heartbreaks. You know, you talk about, you know, the Detroit Lions and, you know, I mean, they, they find creative ways to lose. I mean, you talk about a guy breaking an NFL record in Tucker with 66-yard field goal, and then with 37 seconds left, you lose to a 50-plus field goal. It's like one of those things. Like, you know, those guys love their kicker. But, the, you know, the other, the other team, you know, hates kickers because you talk about so many missed extra points. You talk about 12 missed extra points or missed field goals yesterday, which was tied for the league since the NFL at inception. But also, you know, you talk about, you know, just how many heartbreakers and games usually come down to it. And, you know, you talk about just crazy, right? Ever since the NFL has moved back the extra point, it's not so easy. And they only moved it back a couple of yards. You would think that these kickers would be more accurate you know, but now uh, what excitement that the NFL was added to the NFL because now that that used to be a gimme, right? You go get your popcorn, you go to the refrigerator because you're like, all right, the extra point would be good, I'll come back. But now, not so fast, right? You talk about in the in the charter game, you know, they were going for the had to go for the win and had to try and get points because their kicker had missed an extra point. So I mean, I think it adds some excitement to the game, but I still don't consider kickers people. The thing that was a couple of things with those kicks yesterday that that would amaze me. Number one in that Cincinnati game, like you said. The one that actually hit the flag on top of one of the uprights, that was amazing. You can't do that if you tried, but the fact that he got it to hit one of the flags was incredible. And the one in Minnesota, the fact that he wins the game on a 54-yarder earlier in the quarter, he came up short from 49. He didn't have enough leg from 49, and yet he clears the uprights from 54 to win it. Even though it was indoors, still an incredible kick nonetheless. But, hey, that's what games could come down to. And for a couple of teams, as we saw yesterday, it did. Bills didn't have that problem last night, though, in Kansas City. And I don't think I'm really surprised that Buffalo goes into Arrowhead and wins that game yesterday. I think we have to take a step back here, Bart. And it's only five weeks into the season. But I think the Bills have established themselves as the class of the AFC right now. One of them. I don't, I don't know if they're the class, but, you know, one thing is apparent. Yeah, yeah. The one thing that's apparent is that, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs are in trouble. I'm not saying that I want to count them out. I know for the first time in three years, they're not the favorite to win the championship. They dropped down to three because people figure that maybe Mahomes will figure it out. But, you know, you talk about losing Sammy Watkins and what that means. They go out and sign Josh Gordon to try and find somebody opposite Tariq Hill and Kelsey you know, to be able to make defenses play Giannis. And, you know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers gave the recipe. Play cover two, rush, don't allow Patrick Mahomes to kill you with these five-yard bombs that, you know, Tariq Hill had the week before with the Philadelphia Eagles. And, you know, make that defense work. Don't allow that defense to be able to be one-dimensional because they have a two-score lead because they have Patrick Mahomes. And that defense has proved to be porous. And you talk about the NFL is about the battle of attrition. Frank Clark – just coming back, he had some off the field legal issues with the gun charges. No Chris Jones yesterday. So you talk about when you think about the Kansas City Chiefs, you think about, you know, uh, impact player 
you know, three impact players. And, you know, with the battle of attrition, if you lose one of them, it throws off the effectiveness of that entire defense. And you see a guy like Sorison gets targeted and gets exposed yeah. because you don't have a guy like Chris Jones pushing the pocket, right? You don't have a guy like Honey Badger that's able to cover up for a lot of the, you know, mistakes by behind them. And you see young linebacker core. So, you know, I think they're in trouble. But, you know, you look at the Chargers, I think the Chargers are right there with just a, as a electric quarterback as Josh Allen. Right now, you could say Josh Allen's an MVP candidate, but you definitely got to say so is Justin Herbert. And they both affect the game the same way with their legs, their arms. But I think when you look at, when, for me, when I look at the Chargers, I see a more dominant, better offensive line. Because you, what you didn't hear is a lot of lot of uh, praise and a lot of uh, disruption from Miles Garrett. That's the second time yeah. that Slater, Rashawn Slater, has shut down a guy that was supposed to be the next coming of LT or Derek Thomas. He shut down Chase Young early in the, in the year, and you know he he shuts down a guy that had five sacks or four and a half sacks the week before, and nobody's saying nothing. I know rookies or offensive linemen really don't get offensive player of the year. Everything's going to go to Chase um, to. Um, um, now, who's, who's Burrow's guy? I always say this, man. The, the guy, uh, Chase, Jamar Chase. Everything's going to go to him for rookie of the year. But, man, I think right now, to me, Slater would be my offensive player of the year because the fact that we aren't talking about him says everything. Absolutely. No, he's been a wonderful pick for them here. And look, I mean, you have to have that foundation if you want to have a young quarterback and you want him to be successful. I mean, look, that's why the Jets went out and got Mekhi Becton last year. He's going to be back here certainly to be that blindside protector for your young franchise QB. And it's worked out great there with the Chargers. And you know what? It shows to me also that Cleveland goes out there and they lose a shootout. I think it's important in a way, Bart, because that offense had been struggling a little bit. You know, Baker's got an issue with the left shoulder non-throwing. But still, but I, can I stop you right there? Yeah. Can I, because this is – what happens is when somebody doesn't live up to expectations, they try and find excuses, right? And to tell me that Baker Mayfield has a left shoulder injury to me means I'm absolutely not nothing. I mean, it's a non-throwing shoulder. Guess what? I got a torn labor. Most players have torn labrums. You know, it's not the biggest deal, especially when it's not something that you use because it's your left shoulder. He's not throwing the football with his left shoulder. Right. And I think that they're building an excuse. The problem with Baker Mayfield is he's good. He's not great. Get tickets to see the Jets host the Bengals on Sunday, October 31st at 1 p.m. All fans in attendance receive a free stealth black rally towel presented by Green Giant. Lock in your seats at nyjets.com slash tickets. You know, it's funny. You look at the AFC East right now where it is. And look, the Jets are one in four. Buffalo, they're the class of the division right now. OK, that goes without saying. Miami is struggling. They're still trying to find their way. They're banged up beyond belief. New England, okay, they pulled that one out yesterday in Houston, but, you know, they're far from the juggernaut that they used to be here for. Looking at – no, no. But the thing is, you know, looking ahead here with the Jets, at least, for example, with the schedule, and they got that one against New England up in Foxborough coming out of the bye – there's some opportunities to make some noise here a little bit against some opponents that maybe we thought were a little bit more challenging and daunting when the schedule came out. Now we've seen them play, and you think, that's a winnable game. Well, that's why yesterday we lost was so damaging because that was an opportunity to get a win when the football guys give you a favor when you talk about their two top receivers not being there and going against a defense that hadn't shown that they were dominant. And where you talk about, okay, well, we got the Patriots, but the Patriots doesn't look like they're the Patriots of old, and they're not, right? That defense doesn't scare anybody, and, and Matt Jones has been effective, but he hasn't pushed the ball down the field, so you don't worry about him. But then now you get an opponent that you thought that, hey, maybe we have the advantage of in the Cincinnati Bengals, who look tremendous, right? So that's why you can't like play the games on paper, and that's going to be a much tougher uh, matchup than people anticipated when the schedules came out. Because you talk about Joe Burrow, he's proven that he is a franchise quarterback. There's no questions about that. And you talk about the AFC North, you know, right now, I would say Lamar Jackson is the best quarterback in that division, but Joe Burrow is number two. So everything in this league is earned, and the Jets are going to have to earn the right to get opportunities to win games, and they're going to have to play better, more consistent, and more complete games. They're going to have to play complementary football. No doubt about it. You know, one thing we should mention, too, Arizona, they're the last of the unbeatens. They get a win yesterday against San Francisco. Trey Lance made his first NFL start in that game here. So all the first rounders have now gotten a start of their belts in the National Football League. And, you know, we heard Jamison talk about it a little while ago, too, when we had him on. It's like, that's the way of the world now, right? If you're a rookie quarterback, especially if you're a first rounder, you are going to be on the field sooner rather than later at some point. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's the gift and the curse, right? So many expectations. Quarterbacks are coming more prepared to, 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 to be effective through the passing game because in the college game, all you do is throw the football. That's why I think right now the wide receiver is the the best position when you talk about translating to the pros. It used to be the running game because college used to run the football all the time, so running backs come in easy to play. But, you know, when you talk about, you know, these young quarterbacks and the problem is every once in a while you get a guy like Justin Herbert who looks tremendous his rookie year, a guy like Joe Burrow that comes in and and looks like he's ready day one. And it's unfair to the guys that may need some more time to develop because I think it's based on what you were taught and how you were trained in college, right? And, you know, all these guys that were drafted this year can play, but it's just going to take some time. I think it's unfair to believe that one of these guys are Justin Herbert. I don't think any of these guys in this league is Justin Herbert because Justin Herbert was a guy who has started in college a long time. So when he came here, he had a lot of experience. A lot of these guys right now that came out here didn't have an opportunity to be a starter for a full four years. You talk about Mac Jones, didn't start. Trey Lance really didn't have any opportunities. So, I mean, that's the way of the world. You know, sometimes, you know, you know, it's messed up and the message is, is diluted by guys coming and, and playing and punching above. Hell, Joe Burrow was 25 years old when he got in the league, man. Nobody talks about that. He was older than Lamar Jackson when he was a rookie. You know, yeah, Zach and all these other guys are young. It's a different circumstance, I think, with each team. But, Bart, we got to get out of here now. Enjoy the bye week. We'll be back at it two weeks from now. But a great job as always, my friend. Likewise, man. See you later. All right. He's Bart Scott. I'm Dan Grassa. Thanks for watching Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. So long, everyone.